determined to use that camera on my next outing. Yeah, I got a little on location for you. I want to go out and photograph a single 6x17 shot, so not with this camera. But um, as is the case for many of these photos I find, I uh, discovered it while I was photographing a client's property. And I actually happened to have my 6x17 camera with me that day, which is unusual. But I didn't take the photo because the lighting conditions and the weather weren't what I wanted it to be, so I knew I'd have to come back another day. But I did end up photographing one 6x17 composition that day because in the process of photographing this client's building, I came across a really weird thing. So I was photographing this empty warehouse. They were in the process of renovating it. The inside had been mostly redone, but they hadn't really touched the lot around it. So the parking lot was this crumbled, cracked mess. There's this old guard shack. And in the middle of this asphalt parking lot was a watermelon patch. Mind you, this is in Los Angeles. The nearest farm is probably 40 miles away. I don't know how the hell a watermelon patch sprung up in such a weird random industrial parking lot. It was a little tricky composing it because I was trying to walk a fine line between including enough of the environment around the watermelon patch that it tells the story of where this is located. Because after all, that's the whole point of the photo is how strange this watermelon patch in the middle of this cracked up parking lot is. So I need to include, you know, the power lines and the guard shack and the uh, rundown fence off to the right. I need to include all that stuff, but I don't want to frame so wide that the watermelon patch gets so small in the frame that you can't really tell what it is when you first look at the photo, because um, then it'll just be confusing. So it was a little tricky to strike that balance, but I'm pretty happy with the results. I shot it just after the sun set, get that nice pink sky and that soft light. Now the photo I want to go back and take is just down the road. And if you follow my channel, you know I'm a pretty big advocate of pre-visualization in photography. Uh, I think it's really important to imagine the finished photo before you click the shutter because that gives you some guidance on what to do in terms of composition and lighting and mood. Lately I'm discovering more and more my pre-visualizations tend to be the finished photo on the page of a book. So I'm actually picturing like a finished coffee table book with the photo on one of the pages. When I saw this photo I want to take, I was actually picturing the page turning and revealing the photo. And I could actually picture the two pictures on the spread. This new picture on the right and this other picture on the left. A photo that I had taken quite a while back. It's this photo of a junkyard I took in Santa Ana, California. And I know I just talked about this photo in my latest on location video where I went out and photographed trains in the desert. It might seem like I'm obsessed with this photo, but I'm not, it was just a coincidence. So I'm picturing these two photos on this two page spread. This junkyard photo on the left and the new photo on the right. And so the new photo I would like to jive well with this photo. And so I wanna shoot it in pretty much the same weather conditions. Uh, overcast sky, breaking storm, wet asphalt, that kind of vibe. So over the next few days or weeks or however long it's gonna take, I'm gonna have to wake up in the morning, look at the sky, look at the cloud cover, look at the forecast, and if things are good, I'm just gonna have to haul ass out there. I'm just gonna throw my gear in my car and go. So I don't know when that's gonna be. I guess the next time you see me, I'm probably just gonna be pulling up to the location. All right, we are here. See what I'm talking about? It's a perfect match for that junkyard photo. And I got my cloudy sky too. So things might just go perfectly today. Using my 90 millimeter on this one. Use the 115 on the junkyard shot, but uh, don't have quite as much distance to move back here. So I've uh, positioned myself very carefully left and right here so that I'm actually looking down that pallet canyon, kind of that opening between these stacks. I feel like if I'm looking down that 
hallway, I guess. Uh, that'll give a sense of depth to the scene and won't seem so flat, because then you'll really get a feel for how far into the distance these stacks of pallets go. So I um, wanted to make sure I can actually see down that just a bit. That does put me off center of what I want my composition to be, so I'm just gonna use a little bit of lens shift, not much, to um, get me back where I want. Cool. We just gotta dial in focus, then we can get to meter. You'll notice too, I'm up on a uh, kind of an elevated hill here, which is perfect because that gets me a little bit better view over the fence. And because I'm using a 90 millimeter, which is wide angle, and thus has a uh, pretty heavy vignette, I'm gonna use my center ND. And this holds back one and a third stop of light just in the center of the image. And always a critical part of using a center ND, and one that I almost always forget, is uh, to factor in the one and a third stop it's taking away into my metering. Easiest way to do that is to lower the ISO on your meter one and a third stop. I'm using Portra 160, so instead of ISO 160, I'm gonna use ISO 64. Cool. I'm gonna see if my uh, sky is coming out brighter than I want, because I suspect it is. Let's see. Yeah, it's about two stops brighter than I want it to be. So, I'm gonna use a uh, split ND filter, two stops. I have this kind of Frankenstein looking Lee filter holder that I made to uh, slip over the top of my center ND filter. It's just made out of uh, an old Lee filter holder with a bunch of Sugru built up on the back, which is like this moldable rubber putty. Kind of weird looking, but it worked well. It's always a little difficult getting the filter placement just right for a split ND on any sort of large format system because the ground glass is kind of dark and also the transition, even though I'm using a hard edge, ends up looking pretty soft on these larger formats. But the best way to make that easier on you is to close the aperture down whatever you're planning on using or maybe a little further and that will harden up the transition make it easier to see and you just kind of slide the filter up and down and you'll see it see it come and go definitely don't want to go too low because then you'll start to darken your main subject okay we're gonna do F22 and a third, which, what is that, F25, I think? At one second. Helicopter out of my scene. Come on now. Okay. Actually, better than okay. This is exactly what I wanted. It's kind of weird how easily everything came together this time. Exactly the sky I pictured, no cars in the way. Just one trip to the location, I could get used to this. Just like the junkyard shot, this scene is a good example of an ordered chaos. There's a lot going on, seems a bit messy and chaotic, but actually it's quite orderly. There are a lot of reasons I'm drawn to scenes like this. For one, I just find massive stockpiles of mundane things kind of amusing. They make me think, you know, like it might make me reflect on the repercussions of modern consumerism or think about how tenuous civilized life really is. 
Like, when I see a couple of pallets in the alley behind a grocery store, I don't think of them as much more than garbage. But yes, of course, there must be some massive ecosystem of pallets being bought, sold, traded, and transported every day to keep modern civilization running. There must be yards where these things are stored. Inventoried, repaired, whatever. They bring us our food and our clothes and our medicine. And if that tiny aspect of the economy suddenly ground to a halt, it'd be pandemonium. We'd be setting fire to our cities and flinging feces at each other in no time. These may just look like stacks of weathered wood to you and me, but they're not. These are stacks of socioeconomic stability, my friends. These stacks are the only thing separating you and me from becoming cavemen. I'm even more pleased with this photo seeing it side by side with the junkyard. They flow together well, share a similar theme, and even play off each other with some interesting contrasts. A red fence and a green fence, stacks of wood, stacks of steel. They look good together. I can't wait to see them printed side by side one day. All right, I'm feeling pretty good about that shot. But there's still the issue of that Fuji GA645ZI, the camera I'm so determined to use on this shoot. And, um, you know, generally speaking, I try and let the photo dictate the equipment. So in other words, I have a shot in mind and uh, I'm gonna use whatever equipment is the best tool for that job. Like on this uh, 6x17 shot, I had a picture I wanted to take. 6x17 was the ideal tool for that, so that's what I used. But occasionally, I just really want to use one of my cameras. And that's often the case with this uh, GA645ZI. I rarely have a specific shot in mind that I want to get with this camera. I just really like using this camera. Um, mainly because I'm just in love with the lens. It's ultra sharp, even though it's a zoom, which is surprising. But it's got this gorgeous vignette on it. And um, I think it looks particularly beautiful with uh, black and white film. So I think I'm going to try and get some detail shots here with this uh, GA 645ZI. And um, we're going to make it even more exciting today because I'm going to be shooting a brand new film that I've never shot before. Ilford Kentmere Pan 400. I also have some uh, 100 Kentmere. Ilford reached out to me and they said, we're going to be releasing our beloved Kentmere film on 120 format. Would you like to try some? And I said, sure. I'm not going to do a video about it, but um, if you want to send me some, I'll give it a shot. And here I am making a video about it. So um, I'm not that big on trying new films. I have films I like and I just kind of stick to them because uh, I know how they operate, I know how they work, and they give me the look I want. But um, I've been hearing good things about Kentmere, so I want to give it a try. The one thing Ilford told me though is they're not announcing this until December 1st, so I can't talk about it publicly until December 1st. And guess what today is? November 30th. So, uh... <laughs> keep it on the down low. I'm just goofing. Just some new film goofing, guys. We're just having a good time here. When Ilford reached out to me about Kentmere, I really didn't know jack squat about it. But I did some homework and learned that this is basically meant to be a super affordable black and white film. In Ilford's words, it's for, quote, Budget conscious photographers who still demand high quality. Budget conscious. You gotta love marketing spin. You mean broke ass photographers? But hey, shooting film leaves all of us a little more broke than we want to be. Am I right? So any company that's making an effort to make film more affordable is on the good side of the ledger in my book. Ilford told me, by the way, that compared to their professional films, FP4 and HP5, Kentmere has, quote, a touch more contrast in grain but less latitude for pushing or pulling, and less forgiving to under or over exposure. I'm sure those things are true, but look, I'm not the kind of photographer to be doing side-by-side -side comparison tests of different film stocks. I feel much of the perceived differences people see in similar films can be attributed to, or completely negated by, the scanning process, the post-production workflow, the darkroom printing process, all of those things factor in. So I feel a much better way to gauge whether you like a film or not is just to shoot some rolls of it in conditions you would normally shoot in with subjects you would normally shoot in and then look at the roll in its entirety. And as you flip through the photos, if you constantly get that sinking feeling, that deflated feeling we've all gotten when you get a roll back all excited and it turns out all the pictures suck, if you keep getting that feeling on that film, 
maybe the film isn't for you. But if instead, uh, every time you get a roll back, you flip through the photos and you think, damn, these look like a real photographer took them, then maybe the film's for you. So I got my first roll here of K-Pan. This is gonna be my new stage name. And uh, at first glance on the light table, I gotta say they look a little less contrasty and a little gray heavy um, compared to what I normally like to see. But the scans may tell a different story. Also, it was overcast light, so it may not be the, the fairest assessment of it. So uh, let's get this bad boy scanned up. Alrighty, let's take a look at these scans. Now, I'm not so reckless as to pass judgment on an entire film stock just from one measly roll on one overcast day. So take everything I'm about to say with a big fat grain of salt. It was just one roll in one situation. But I have to say, as I was looking through these photos, I did get a bit of that deflated feeling where I feel like the photos just aren't all that good. But that's almost definitely because the pictures just aren't all that good. I didn't take any Pulitzer Prize winners here, folks. So I'm sure I'm just reacting to that. In scanning the film though, I did notice I was having to boost the contrast quite a bit more than I normally do. Again, that doesn't mean it's the film's fault. It was flat overcast light, that's low contrast anyway, and maybe it'd be easily remedied with a uh, red or yellow filter to bring a little contrast in, which I often use when I'm shooting black and white. I just didn't on this scenario. So the film's great. It doesn't look all that different to me than uh, HP5, which is one of my favorite black and white films. Um, so in terms of it being kind of a more affordable black and white film and it being available in two formats now, that's fantastic, man. Good on Ilford for uh, bringing photography to the masses. But there is one thing I'll say for certain. This camera, as much as I love it, there is one aspect to it that just makes me want to spike it on the ground like I just scored the winning touchdown. And that is the autofocus system. It has a single autofocus point. It's sometimes right. And the manual focus option on this is so cumbersome that it's not even realistic to use it out in the field, in my opinion. The autofocus, you know, you try and focus on the fence and it focuses kind of on the background. Then I go to take a picture through the fence, trying to focus on the background, thinking I'm doing everything right to get the autofocus to go to the right spot. And it focuses on nowhere in particular. So it's just an annoying system. If this camera had a traditional manual focus lens with the uh, helical focusing system, the camera would just be like perfect. It's a great camera, except for that. I wish there was an easy way around it, but there isn't. Overall though, I'm just really happy I got this uh, six by 17 shot. I think it's gonna be a perfect companion to that junkyard photo in a book someday, I hope. But whatever the case, thanks for coming along with me on this little outing. I do hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.